Good morning or good afternoon, according to your time zone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this Council of Affiliated Menopause Societies, the CAMS Menopause Hour, which is a co-production of the International Menopause Society, the IMS, and the European Menopause and Anthropos Society, the IMAS. I'm Dimitrios Goulis, a reproductive endocrinologist from Greece and the immediate past president of the European Menopause and Anthropose Society. The webinar series is dedicated to the promotion of menopausal health, and today we will discuss cardiometabolic disease and vasomotor symptoms. Indeed, two of the main issues, if not the major ones for menopausal women, are the assessment of their cardiometabolic risk and the alleviation of their vasomotor symptoms in a personalized way. Today, we will discuss exactly these issues. Dr. Elena Armeni from the UK will discuss with us all we need to know about assessing cardiovascular and metabolic risk, whereas Professor Antonio Cano from Spain will give us new insights into dealing with vasomotor symptoms through modulation of the neurokinin 3 receptors. Before we begin, IMS and EMAS would like to thank Abbott for their support and for making this webinar series possible. Nevertheless, we must clarify that the scientific program and its context are exclusively the responsibility of the speakers and the scientific societies. So please visit the IMS website to learn more about the many educational events and resources listed here and to learn about how to become an IMS member. Many resources are available, including exclusive offers for IMS member, a free one-year IMS membership with completion of your impact level one, and IMS offer offers in a partnership with local and regional societies member of the camps. Monthly, there are live events like today's, and an extensive library of educational resources. So please find out more at www.imssociety.org. Finally, the 19th IMS World Congress on Menopause will take place in Melbourne, Australia in 2024. You can scan the QR code or visit the Congress website for more information. Moving on to technical issues. Uh, you have entered this webinar into listen-only mode. This means that your microphone is muted and you can. Uh, we do not pick up any noise from your end. We do welcome and encourage you to submit your text questions via the, via the Q&A widget located on your Zoom panel or your uh, mobile phone. Please search for it now. You can enter your questions at any time and we will read and discuss them during the end of this webinar. Finally, I remind you that we are recording today's webinar and it will be accessible on the IMS website. So it's my great pleasure to present you Dr. Elena Armeni from the UK. Dr. Armeni is a consultant endocrinologist with an MD and PhD from the National and Capodistrian University of Athens and a postgraduate diploma and an MSc holder in diabetes mellitus from the University of South Wales. She is currently a board member of the European Menopause and Anthropose Society, and she also serves as associate editor at two well-known journals in the field of endocrinology, the Maturitas and the Frontiers in Endocrinology. She has authored several publications in peer-reviewed journals. Her core competencies include hormone replacement therapy, neuroendocrinology, diabetes, and reproductive health. So I think you agree with me, she is fully licensed to discuss with us the cardiometabolic risk in women through their menopausal journey. Elena. You're right, thank you. So dear Professor Goulis and dear International Menopause Society, thank you for the kind invitation in order to discuss this really interesting topic with you today. A very large number of my research papers have been around cardiometabolic risk, which is probably the most not taken into consideration, I would say, not 
regarded as carefully as it should be regarded around midlife. And therefore, it is very much important to pay attention to the true risk that women are likely to face when they enter the menopause. So we start with some general information and a reminder of what the menopause is all about. In practicality, the hormonal fluctuations start happening before the final menstrual period. The menopausal transition, which means the time before the final menstrual period, when the variability in the menstrual cycle is usually increased, is characterized by symptoms that have been documented to imply heightened cardiovascular risk. And I'm referring in particular to vasomotor complaints. The risk of cardiovascular disease is much higher according to observational data after the final menstrual period and obviously after the, within the menopause, that means 12 months after the last period. The type of menopause plays a role into the cardiovascular risk according to the results of a various and big number of studies, whereas natural menopause is related with an average cardiovascular risk, but premature or early menopause and surgical or iatrogenic induced menopause have also, have also been shown to increase the cardiovascular risk for the later life disproportionately in comparison to the spontaneous cessation of ovarian function. So as the woman ages during the reproductive life, changes are happening. And in particular, two years before the menopause, that means one year before the final period, the loss of ovarian follicles and their function starts taking place, which contributes or happens together with a decrease in levels of inhibin beta, anti-Millerian hormone and estrogen levels, which is also associated with a desynchronized secretion of GnRH, FSH and LH. All of these hormonal changes lead to the loss of the menstrual cycle, the vasomotor symptoms, mood and sleep disorders, urogenital atrophy, and later on cardiovascular disease and osteoporosis. Fairly recently, a vast majority of data supported that even the vasomotor symptoms per se have been associated with cardiovascular disease, apart from the association that you can nicely observe in this figure. So cardiovascular risk after the menopause, yes. Hormones and their alteration is contributing, but According to the latest data, even the vasomotor symptoms individually, independently, have been considered to contribute into the development of cardiovascular disease. The symptoms around the time of perimenopause and early postmenopause are well known, but I would like to bring a reminder. When we refer to vasomotor symptoms, it is hot flashes, night sweats, and sleep disorders. There is also the anxiety and the mood disorders, which present as irritability, panic attacks, mood instability, and loss of interest for daily tasks, but also somatic symptoms like myalgia, arthralgia, headaches and vertigo, fatigue, and tachycardia. The estrogen deficiency has long been associated with implications with regards to cardiovascular health. The hormone changes with aging and around the time of the menopause can be summarized as a reduction in levels of estrogen and age-related reduction of sex hormone binding globulin levels, whilst ovarian senescence results into an increase of the androgen to estrogen ratio and an apparent hyperandrogenemia. The consequences are impaired fibrinolysis, visceral adiposity, insulin resistance, and this apparent environment of hyperandrogenism. The visceral adiposity and insulin resistance contribute to metabolic dysfunction, oxidative stress, and low-grade chronic inflammation, leading to endothelial dysfunction and later on atherosclerosis. The impaired fibrinolysis also results to atherosclerosis, while hyperandrogenism 
has play, been shown to play another individual role in the development of metabolic dysfunction, oxidative stress, but also endothelial dysfunction and atherosclerosis. In vitro data has shown that estrogen and particular 17 beta estradiol has an important role in controlling the vasculature with improving vasodilation, the fibrosis of vessel of the cells that are to be found in the vessels, namely reducing fibroblast migration, proliferation, collagen deposition. Improving the health of mitochondria with a pro-survival anti-apoptotic effect and controlling oxidative stress because of the antioxidant properties. As the woman goes through the menopause, the estrogen withdrawal and the androgen excess contribute to body composition changes. The increase in total fat mass becomes apparent fairly shortly after the menopausal transition with an increase in the visceral abdominal fat, subcutaneous fat, ectopic fat storage, a decrease in peripheral fat and reduced total and peripheral lean body mass. The visceral adipose tissue accumulation contributes mainly to the development of heightened increased levels of reactive oxygen species, which correspond to inflammation leading to insulin resistance. Ultimately, the woman starts experiencing feeling that the daily caloric intake is increased day after day. That has an effect on satiety and emotional eating, whilst the ability to burn the calories, the energy expenditure, goes down, is reduced because of comorbidities and sarcopenia. The ultimate outcome is an increase in body weight. Aging and menopause have also have been shown to have a very complicated effect, a little bit more complicated than we described earlier with regards to the development of insulin resistance, which increases the risk for type 2 diabetes and eventually cardiovascular disease. Aging and menopause, therefore, we are shown to be linked with a reduction in physical activity, deterioration of the mood and increased risk for comorbidities with increase of body weight because of loss of body mass and decreased energy expenditure, whilst the low estrogen contributing to changes to insulin action, but also changes in insulin secretion and degradation. Ultimately, there is a failure evident with regards to the functional ability of the pancreas to meet increased insulin needs. Ultimately, a clear risk for type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So in uh, 2017, uh, the Population-Based Lifelines Cohort Study investigated 63,466 women aged 18 to 65 years and 39,379 of those women were premenopausal. This study tried to show the association between age and menopause and levels of blood lipids. They showed that the postmenopausal levels, you can see the green line, especially higher than every other line after the age of 45 to 50 years on both categories, both for total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. So there is clear evidence that total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol is increasing over time with the age and the menopause. Subsequently, in 2015, we got the results of another interesting study that shows clear differences in the mean levels of total cholesterol, triglycerides, and LDL cholesterol, comparing premenopausal, postmenopausal women and men. The postmenopausal women appear to have significantly higher levels of total cholesterol in comparison to premenopausal women or men, higher levels of triglycerides in comparison to the premenopause, but not in comparison to men, and the same picture of LDL cholesterol. The postmenopause is not favorable when it comes to levels of LDL cholesterol when compared to the younger reproductively active years. The result is still slightly better when compared to the group of men. 
In a meta-analysis of 66 studies and a total of 114,655 women, the authors tried to describe the average increase in levels of total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, triglycerides, and HDL. So HDL does not seem to change with regards to quantity. However, total cholesterol increases on average by 22.4 milligram per deciliter, LDL cholesterol on average 17.4 milligram per deciliter, triglycerides on average 23.9 milligram per deciliter. However, HDL cholesterol levels appear to lose to lose the protective effect after the menopause. That has been shown in a large study of 2022 plus recent study, earlier studies from 2016 and 2020, where the cholesterol efflux capacity from macrophage, macrophage was investigated. So important reminder, HDL does not change in quantity, but changes in quality. It's not as effective in its protective action anymore when it comes to the cardiovascular system. We have a change in functionality. Now, another important cardiovascular risk factor is blood pressure, hypertension. The prevalence of hypertension in women appears to increase exponentially after the age of 60 years, which is what the orange bar is standing for, in comparison to women aged 40 to 59 years of age or younger. When compared to men, we have similar prevalence rates after the age of 60, men versus women, but women still are more effective, affected than men. With regards to the effect of aging, menopause and hormone changes, it has been shown around in a publication of 2015 that menopause and ages and aging due to obesity predisposed to atherosclerosis that can increase the risk for ischemic heart disease and stroke. The lowering of estrogen levels though has a direct effect on the vasculature with activation of the renin angiotensin system, increased angiotensin two levels, endothelin one, and a decrease in the nitric oxide synthase, which leads to oxidative stress, vascular cell proliferation, vascular wall inflammation, arterial stiffness, and endothelial dysfunction. The indirect effects of estrogen decline after the menopause have been already discussed, and in summary, it is the central body fat accumulation, is the change in lipid levels, is the insulin resistance, and the increase in the blood pressure, together with the environment of chronic inflammation. Recently, the authors of a Lancet publication tried to summarize the effect of vasomotor symptoms with regards to the cardiovascular system, and they concluded that the heightened BMI, the way circumference, the insulin resistance, the unfavorable, unfavorable changes in lipid levels, hypertension, re increase the risk for endothelial dysfunction, atherosclerosis, metabolic syndrome, and cardiovascular disease. So what are the implications of the metabolic transition upon the risk? In a study of 2016, the authors from a small sample study of 180 postmenopausal women showed that the changes observed in endothelial function, estimated according to the flow mediated dilation, are more sharp in women with higher androgen levels as opposed to those with moderate or lower androgen levels. That highlights the role of hyperandrogenemia. The study of women's health across the nation showed in 2020 that the changes in the stiffness of the arteries is more pronounced around the time of the menopause. That means within one year of the final menstrual period, and it tries to stabilize, rationalize thereafter. So, all of the damage that happens to the vessels, the stiffness that leads to hypertension, that takes place during the first 12 months after the final menstrual period. Similarly, another, another analysis of the same study showed in 2013 that the late perimenopausal stage is 
the time of life when the arteries start thickening. The intima media thickness progression starts to become much more apparent in comparison to the other stages of reproductive life. So the thickening of the arteries takes place around the late perimenopause in comparison to early perimenopause or postmenopause. And what about the hormone replacement therapy? In 2019 and, uh, apologies, in 1991, a large number of studies tried to show the protective effect of unopposed estrogen in postmenopausal women, which was associated with a significantly lower relative risk of coronary heart disease. The WHI tried to change the way we look at things because of an original fear from the way the results were explained at that time. Uh, in order to remind you, this gold standard, but very outdated nowadays study around the effect of hormone replacement therapy was consisting of two arms, estrogen and progesterone or estrogen only. The aim of the study was to investigate death from coronary heart disease or non-fatal MI, myocardial infarction that is. And the study was prematurely terminated, especially the estrogen progesterone arm, because of a heightened incidence of breast cancer, whilst the estrogen only arm was stopped after 7.2 years due to an increased incidence of stroke. What did we learn? Repeated reanalysis and back-to-back -back investigations and evaluations of this study showed that an important point of consideration is the age of the woman when HRT is started, together with the fact that progesterone has a role of its own when it comes to cardiovascular disease. So the learning point of WHI was actually the window of opportunity. That means it's better to start hormone replacement therapy to a woman that is younger, closer to the last menstrual period rather than to somebody who is older and most likely has accumulated already a significant amount of cardiovascular risk and atherosclerosis. The Kronos Early Estrogen Prevention Study also showed that there is a difference according to the regimen that is provided to the patient when it comes to the thickening of the arteries. And in a simplistic way, I will try to make it very straightforward for you. Transdermal estrogen is always more protective, or at least less harmful, with regards to the changes of carotid intima media thickness when compared to oral combined estrogen, conjugated equine estrogen. early versus late treatment with estradiol. That was another aspect of the study, which the LITE trial tried to show as to whether or not treatment during the early menopausal phase or late menopausal phase is important with regards to cardiovascular outcomes. What the author showed was once again, the same learning point as we have already discussed. That means that Treatment with HRT shortly after the menopause is protective because of the fact that the changes observed in the, ch in the carotid intima media thickness are less when the treatment starts closer to the final menstrual period rather than later, much later after the final menstrual period. Now, a meta-regression analysis of 31 randomized control trials also confirmed similar findings that early HRT appears to be much more protective than late HRT when it comes to all-cause mortality, cardiac mortality, all coronary events. However, there is a risk of stroke, TIA, and systemic embolism, which in any case is smaller when you try to quantify if the HRT started shortly after the last menstrual period. That brings us to the window of opportunity, this learning point, according to which in young recently menopaused women, HRT exerts a beneficial effect on cardiovascular risk factors, whilst in older women, HRT can destabilize the plaque, leading to acute thrombotic events. Approaching the end, it is important to consider the cardiovascular risk when trying to explore the suitability, the 
options of your patient with regards to cardiovascular risk. As recommended by the European Menopause Society, it is important to quantify the cardiovascular risk using any of the internationally available algorithms that you like. So in particular, if there is one or no cardiovascular risk factors, you can use one type, any type of HRT. Multiple cardiovascular risk factors, you can use transdermal, while if there are many important cardiovascular risk factors, long-standing and more complicated, and by multiple, I mean three or more, ideally no systemic HRT, only vaginal preparations. In summary, menopause increases the risk of diabetes mellitus as well as clinical and subclinical cardiovascular disease. Evidence suggests that the severity of vasomotor symptoms is also associated with this risk, and HRT can be helpful, reducing also the risk of osteoporosis and cardiovascular disease. I want to thank my colleagues from the second department of obstetrics and gynecology in Arateo Hospital because of the ongoing collaboration. Thank you very much to all. Elena, thank you very much for this very concise, informative, and educational lecture. Our second distinguished uh, speaker is Professor Antonio Cano. He is a full professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Valencia, Spain, and head of the obstetrics and gynecology department at the Clinical University Hospital, the Incliva in Valencia. He has authored several books and around 300 papers written in English or Spanish, many of them in the field of menopause and women's health. He is a member of the board in several scientific journals and editor for gynecology section of the European Journal of Obstetrics, Gynecology and Reproductive Biology. Professor Cano is a former president of the European Menopause and Andropos Society, and we will take advantage of his extensive experience and learn new things on modulation of the neurokinin-3 receptors for vasomotor symptoms. Antonio. Well, many thanks, uh, Professor Gulis, my dear Dimitrios. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay. <clears throat> As I said, many thanks for your kind introduction. And many thanks uh, for the invitation uh, to IMS and to IMAS, uh, two uh, hugely reputed societies dedicated to menopause and women's health. Um, the topic uh, I will address, as um, uh, introduced by Professor Gullis, is vasomotor symptoms and the modulation of the neurokinin 3 receptors. This is a new therapeutic area which uh, will uh, grow, certainly, as far as we know, for the research which is going on in the area of the control of vasomotor symptoms, but also, as we will see, with implications in other areas related with uh, the Batherson symptoms of minus pulse and the uh, quality of life. This is uh, my disclosure. And it was, um, I want just uh, to introduce you, uh, which is the target population we are speaking of. If we consider the world uh, pyramid uh, today, uh, this was data of this morning, you see that uh, women uh, group uh, around 45 till 54 years of age uh, amount something like uh, 500 uh, million women. But it is not only this uh, global view of the general population, but also that the number of women who uh, are uh, suffering from menopausal symptoms is increasing because there is a, a population of women with a premature ovarian insufficiency. Uh, and in this area, it is uh, particularly interesting, the area of uh, breast cancer survivors. This is data of Canada, just showing something which has been reproduced in many other countries. You see here from 1984 till 2020, which is the uh, linear decrease, this is the yellow line, uh, in mortality related with breast cancer. And in uh, blue, you have, uh, which is the incidence of uh, the disease, which on the right, you have it uh, divided by uh, intervals of age. And you see that in perimenopausal and premenopausal women still is a big part of uh, the uh, women suffering from this disease. This applies to other areas so that finally it comes that there is a very important number, very high number of women who uh, are in need of this approach. 
This is population data, uh, data from the uh, study of women across the nation, in which uh, you may see how uh, there are differences in the trajectories, which is uh, uh, all the different trajectories uh, for entering into menopause concerning the incidence and the intensity of racial motor symptoms. You see here, for example, those uh, women who start early uh, previous to menopause with racial motor symptoms. And you have here in the center with this uh, interrupted green line, which is the mean in which uh, you see that uh, around seven, eight years is uh, the uh, mean duration of uh, basal motor symptoms in the general population. That means that uh, some women, like for example, those that we were commenting uh, starting early in uh, previous to menopause, they still continue having uh, important uh, incidence and important intensity of basal motor symptoms uh, for many years. And there is also a high variety in intensity of the symptoms. This is, uh, again, data from uh, a study in Europe and the uh, United States. Let's concentrate our attention here on the left, in which uh, we have uh, four different uh, bars uh, defining uh, how uh, basal motor symptoms uh, appear uh, at work of a study, uh, the quality of sleep, and then, then move and overall quality of life. And considering, for example, the basal motor symptoms uh, appearing in the um, at work of a study, you see how uh, for two, three percent of them, the problem is a severe problem, a problem as bad as can be. So it means that it's not only that there are many women affected by the problem, but also that uh, the uh, intensity of the problem in some of them uh, is particularly uh, bothersome so that uh, that uh, goes to the need of uh, attending this. And this is the area which is represented by the uh, antagonist of the neurokinin receptors. This is, as I was commenting, an innovative area because uh, has uh, been able to open uh, data and information about how uh, basal motor symptoms uh, occur at the level of the uh, brain, the central ne nervous system. You see here in blue neurons uh, of the arcuate nu nucleus, and here on the right those of the preoptical uh, nucleus. You see how they are connected, uh, and the neurosecretion of the neurons in the arcuate nucleus directly goes to the dendritic terminals in those in the uh, preoptical uh, nucleus. And the interesting thing is that we now know. And this is a studies uh, that have been uh, completed in the last uh, 15, 10, 15 years. We know that there are receptors for estrogen receptors in um, those neurons, and the decline in estrogens uh, occurring at menopause uh, means that there is a release in the synthesis and the uh, liberation of uh, peptides, uh, kispeptin, neurokinin, uh, and uh, also dynorphin. Uh, which are uh, produced in huge amounts. So that means that there is a uh, tsunami, a real uh, overload of uh, those uh, peptides, and particularly in the case uh, that it is of our interest, neurokinin uh, B, in uh, arriving at those neurons, uh, which an impact at the level of the control of the thermoregulatory center. That means that at a temperature which may be normal for most uh, of uh, the population, in these uh, persons, in the case of women with basal motor symptoms, there is a, a feeling of a high temperature, and the response is that uh, the physiological response for an increase in temperature. So, uh, the great uh, advancement in the case of uh, neurokinin uh, antagonists is that uh, these uh, design molecules are able to bind to the receptor of uh, the receptors in neurokinin at the level of the dendritic terminals in those neurons, and they block the action of neurokinin so that there is an improvement in the control of the basomotor symptoms. So, as a, a consequence of that, uh, there is a, a very active research in the latter years uh, concerning the design and the uh, clinical studies uh, of uh, products that are able to uh, control, to block those uh, receptors. Okay. 
What I am going to present now is data from these studies. Studies with one molecule, which is a fesolinetant. Fesolinetant is one antagonist, one of the, as I was saying, uh, of the uh, available antagonist uh, of the neurokinin receptors that uh, has been investigated in different uh, studies. Uh, as I was commenting, there are two big studies, Skylight 1 and Skylight 2. They are uh, broader studies because they, are, they have the similar design, similar numbers of participants, and uh, the conclusions, as we will see in my uh, later on in my talk, uh, the conclusions are very much the same. Something which is important because, uh, in a way, it, is a, it gives consistency uh, to uh, the findings in one and another study. There is then a Skylight 4, which is a long term study to evaluate uh, the uh, safety of uh, Fesolinetan, and there are other studies which have been completed and not, are not now uh, being uh, under publication. This is uh, the design of the study in which um, a number of women with moderate of severe vasomotor symptoms were treated with either placebo 30 or 45 milligrams of Fesolinetan. They were randomized, one, 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 and they were uh, investigated for a period of 12 weeks. Then, at the completion of this period, uh, women uh, receiving placebo were re-randomized to either 30 or 45 milligrams so that the whole cohort was uh, being treated with uh, fesolinetan at one or the other dose, and they, uh, they were followed for up to 52 uh, weeks. This is uh, the primary endpoints, which were uh, two, uh, was the mean change in frequency and severity of vasomotor symptoms, there was a key secondary endpoint, which is in the change in sleep, in the quality of sleep. And this is something important as I was commenting um, some minutes ago, because uh, the control of basomotor symptoms gives the opportunity to uh, deep into the possibility that other areas related with the malfunction of the uh, central nervous systems uh, as a, a result of the decline in estrogen might have uh, an effect. Other endpoints include uh, the uh, mean change in the frequency of severity of moderate to severe vasomotor symptoms from um, week um, um, 12 to 52. Then uh, the percentage of women uh, who um, achieve a reduction of at least uh, 50 or even 70 or more percent in the frequency of moderate to severe vasomotor symptoms changes in the quality of life because of the improvement in the symptoms that was measured with the men call, and also an evaluation of um, the patient global impression uh, concerning the quality of sleep, uh, the patient global impression of change or of the severity of the, um, the malfunction and the level of, uh, of the, uh, the sleep. And obviously safety, frequency and severity of adverse symptoms. I will not go into much detail in this slide, just to um, take your attention to the three arms of the study, in which you have one of them, uh, 175 women assigned to placebo, and then 176, 176 again, to 30 or 45 milligrams uh, of fesolimate. And um, these were uh, the results. You see here uh, the impact up to the week uh, 12, and also an in, uh, interim uh, evaluation at week uh, number four. Uh, this is uh, changes and the level of the frequency of basometer symptoms uh, comparing uh, in black uh, placebo versus 30 or 45 uh, milligrams of um, fesolimeter. And you see how it is, it is uh, at week number four, week number two, 12, which is the difference between placebo and uh, the reduction achieved uh, by the uh, two doses of uh, fesolinetant. And here on the right, you have uh, in a specific numbers, which was uh, the least square uh, reduction, achieved by 30 and um, by 45 milligrams of fesolinetant at 30 um, at um, the fourth and the 12th uh, week. Similar um, results, actually, it might be a very, very similar uh, uh, slide uh, when we evaluate uh, the severity. See also how there is a decrease, uh, very much similar in the case of 30 and 45 milligrams versus the placebo. 
and obviously a placebo effect, which is something that we know since many, many years concerning the uh, result or the impact at the level of the uh, vasomotor symptoms. This is uh, an interesting slide because it shows how is uh, the time course of the changes in, uh, in the frequency uh, of vasomotor symptoms uh, as uh, time uh, goes by. You see here the evaluation at the fourth and at the twelfth uh, week. You see how it is quite quick, the reduction uh, in the uh, frequency of vasomotor symptoms for both 30 and 45 milligrams, and there is an um, lowest level which is uh, achieved between the third and the fourth uh, week. And a similar result may be found for placebo. Obviously, uh, it seems that there is a less difference between, between placebo and uh, 30 and 45 milligrams uh, of fesolinetan, but this is only because the interval uh, in the severity of uh, basal motor symptoms is slower, is smaller than that uh, concerning the frequency. Again, uh, one of the secondary endpoints was uh, the disclosure of, uh, which was the number of women who achieved a reduction of uh, approximately 50% or more uh, with the two uh, different uh, dosages of um, placebo uh, and, and 30 and 45 uh, mes mesolinetan. And you see how there is a reduction, which is around 40, 45, 50% uh, in women who uh, achieve, as I was commenting, uh, a reduction of at least a 50% uh, in the frequency and severity of moderate to severe vasomotor symptoms. But if we consider the women that receive 75%, which is more, more uh, demanding as a uh, result, you see how it is uh, less, but still it is uh, something which uh, arrives to 20, almost 30% of women who achieve uh, this uh, size in the reduction. Um, this describes also the time course, but considering uh, women who were uh, treated with uh, placebo and who were then pre-randomized to 30 or 45 milligram, uh, milligrams of fesolinetan, and you see which is uh, the extension to 52 weeks, in which uh, there is uh, an overlapping between uh, those uh, who initially were treated with placebo, but once they receive fesolinetan, they overlap, as I say, uh, with uh, the uh, women who were treated with uh, fesolinetan since the very beginning. And uh, this is something uh, that uh, applies uh, to uh, also uh, to the severity of the vasomotor symptoms, which reproduces uh, the effect that was found uh, for uh, uh, frequency. Another important issue was uh, the impact of the level of sleep. There is, as shown here, uh, this is in the patient global integration of change, uh, the upper uh, part of the panel, and uh, severity in the lower part uh, of the panel. And you see how uh, 45 milligrams of fesolinetan, when considering together much better, moderately better, and a little better, uh, achieves a reduction, uh, achieves an improvement in uh, almost around 80% uh, of the women. A little bit less for uh, 30 milligrams and a little bit less uh, for placebo. The difference was statistically significant. And this is important, as I said, because um, another area of uh, in important research, because we don't know exactly uh, at the present moment if it is only the consequence of the improvement of uh, vasomotor symptoms, or instead there might be also a direct action of uh, the antagonism of neurocrine receptors at the level of the control of the sleep. And again, uh, when considering the patient global impression of severity, there are again differences in favor of uh, mainly fesolinetan 45 milligrams, which was much more active than uh, 30 milligrams uh, in this area of interest. There are also data concerning uh, the quality of life, and uh, for that, um, the main call tool was used. Uh, you have here two different types of information. On the left, you see which is the global impact. Uh, including placebo, and on the right, uh, without placebo. So this is the neat uh, impact of the product because placebo is the reference. And you see how uh, there is a reduction uh, at both uh, both sides, obviously much more uh, uh, 
important on the right because um, the effect of placebo is not a subtract. And um, this is, uh, as I say and shown in the slide, uh, something which is not uh, terribly different uh, between 30 and 45 milligrams. And then safety. Safety is something important because this is an in product. This is something which uh, uh, needs to be deeply investigated. And there are different uh, areas of interest concerning uh, this uh, group of uh, molecules, uh, molecules uh, which block uh, the uh, neurokinin uh, receptor. So you see that um, the five serious uh, treatment emerging adverse effect uh, were uh, increases on transaminases in one uh, case and uh, increase of liver functional test in another case. Uh, paresthesia, varicose vein, and cholelithiasis. Those were the five serious. But uh, concerning the most common headache, was the most common, which uh, was detected in 5 and 6 percent uh, in fesolimid and 30 and 45, but it was detected in 7 percent in placebo. So uh, finally, nothing uh, different to what happened in the placebo. And in this uh, very much uh, informative table, well, you see that uh, there are different areas, again, headache, blood glucose increase, abdominal pain, atrophy, and so on. Just uh, pay uh, uh, attention here to the right to the three columns, uh, placebo, fesolimetan, uh, 30 and 45 milligrams, and you will find that there are not uh, uh, significant differences between placebo and uh, any of the two dosages of the drug uh, for most of the um, areas of interest. And this is also important. It's important because these products, uh, there is a, a previous experience with one, uh, with one um, antagonist uh, of the neurokinin receptors, which was um, not um, promoted in research after initial data in which there was increases, uh, important increases at the, level, at the level of the liver enzymes. And this is uh, the data. Uh, of the uh, skylight one, which you see here that uh, we have four windows. On the upper window you see, uh, which is the level of the lead rubin, and um, uh, the, the transaminases here. Uh, and you see that uh, there is an accumulation of uh, the cases in areas in which uh, there, were, uh, there was a normal or a slightly elevated uh, alanine transaminase or aspartate transaminases. There are a few cases, including placebo, in which there was a, a higher increase, but there was no increase with the exception of one case of bilirubin, and that case had a normal uh, enzyme leverage. So this is an important uh, slide because it shows uh, something uh, important, it is safety, and um, which has uh, taken the European Medicine Agency to um, uh, get free uh, for women concerning the evaluation of the uh, liver enzymes. I will not go in much detail in the skylight 2. I said that this uh, broader study with the skylight 1, uh, the numbers are very similar, 501, 567, 66 and 67 is very, very similar to what uh, was uh, investigated in the case of skylight 1. And just uh, to show uh, small differences in the case of um, the uh, impact at the level of sleep, is here 45 and 30 milligrams of esolinetan and placebo, and you see that there is a still a higher difference between 45 milligrams and placebo than in the case of the skylight one. Uh, well, again, uh, severity of the sleep uh, also uh, significantly different for 45 milligrams versus the other two options. So this is an area as I was commenting, which is um, uh, receiving much attention uh, concerning the impact of the solid. And this is my last slide. Just to conclude, um, the main message is probably that we have in hand a new uh, product, which uh, is uh, something that um, will be increased with uh, other molecules and probably will help uh, quite a lot in the management of vasomotor symptoms in a uh, menopausal period. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonio, for this very comprehensive, informative, and practical, I would say, presentation. 
Uh, dear colleagues, I must thank uh, both our invited speakers who clarified many issues regarding assessing the cardiometabolic risk and alleviating the vasomotor symptoms in menopausal women in a personalized way, I would say. Nevertheless, a good lecture always provokes questions, so we are awaiting for yours. Please use the Q&A widget located in your uh, Zoom panel or your mobile phone. Uh, in order to kick off, Eleni, I have a question for you uh, by Ruth, and it's about HDL. So can you please repeat the, the changes in HDL functionality upon menopause? What does it mean in relation of HDL subtypes? And does exercise or other measures overcome these changes? So HDL through menopause. So HDL after the menopausal transition does not change in quantity. That means the amount of HDL appears to be still the same, but the studies have shown that the ability of HDL to act protective when it comes to the cardiovascular system is reduced. With regards to the subtypes of HDL, so there is some data, but I'm afraid such a detailed information I cannot recall on top of my head. However, I can already tell you that physical activity and in particular going up the stairs has been associated with an improvement in HDL levels in women. The study has been observational though. So the improvement in HDL levels after physical activity is referring to quantity of HDL because no study, as far as I'm aware at least, has been done with regards to changes in functionality of HDL after physical activity. That's very nice, uh, Eleni. So going up the stairs, not going down the stairs. This is the, the important meaning. <laughs> uh, Antonio, thank you very much for uh, the new data you presented. I'd like to ask something about uh, efficacy and something about safety of this new medication. So you already mentioned the, 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 the efficacy of this medication, but uh, in a practical uh, way, could you give us a, a time course, not only week by week, but I would say day by day in the effect of the frequency and severity of uh, vasomotor symptoms? Yes, uh, well, that's a very uh, nice question because uh, these data were not available uh, from the Skylight uh, 1, which has been most of uh, my talk uh, dedicated to, uh, but uh, from another study, which is Daylight, uh, which extends for 24 weeks, and in which only 45 milligrams of pesognitan are being, uh, have been investigated. And there are data day by day. And the good thing is that uh, there is a sudden decrease in the uh, frequency and intensity of the hot flashes of the vasomotor symptoms uh, up to the day three or four. Uh, so um, what we uh, have observed that there is a decrease, for example, from the first week, even that first week uh, and the days one, two, three, four uh, are those in which uh, the decrease is uh, higher. So this is also interesting because uh, we know, for example, that uh, menopausal hormone therapy requires some days, not much more either, but uh, some days uh, to get uh, an uh, acceptable result uh, for uh, the user. And in this case, uh, well, it seems that it's uh, quite quick. Why is it? Uh, well, probably because uh, we don't know, but uh, probably that mechanism of uh, blocking the um, uh, neurochemical receptor is uh, quick enough uh, to produce uh, a, a reset of the threshold of the uh, thermoregulatory center in order to uh, provide some benefit. But this is still very speculative. I think it's a very uh, an area in which uh, research in the coming years will tell us uh, much detail about uh, that uh, black box, which was the hypothalamus and uh, the yeah. control of the, the, the hot flashes. Very interesting for the whole endocrinology, not only uh, menopause. And my safety question would be, uh, there are some issues about possible adverse effects of phezolinetant on, on neoplastic risk. 
Is there a solid argument about this? Well, yes. Um, I don't know uh, if um, the, our attendees are familiar with uh, the debate in The Lancet because there was a letter um, trying to show that uh, there was an increase in uh, neoplastic risk in women uh, who were treated with fesolimetant. The data were reviewed. There is an uh, answer in The Lancet as well. There is a letter detailing uh, how the uh, supposed increase, which was actually reviewed by the FEA and by the EMA, uh, was uh, not found uh, related with the drug. Uh, and there are other several reasons which uh, militate against uh, that uh, potential association. For example, the heterogeneity of the tumors or the short latency between the use of the drug and the detection of the tumors, or uh, even the biological plausibility, because uh, as far as we know, there is uh, no uh, confirmed mechanism uh, in which in the um, blockade of the neurotoxin uh, uh, receptor might have something to do with, for example, proliferation, or with some pathways related with uh, mutation or with uh, neoplastic transformation of cells. So uh, although the issue is obviously very interesting, but uh, it was uh, not confirmed at all. And uh, as far as we know, there is nothing in that regard. Thank you very much, uh, Antonio. Uh, Eleni, in order to make it practical, uh, what would be the, the baseline investigation that you would uh, prescribe to a menopausal lady concerning her cardiovascular health, especially if you are thinking of starting uh, menopausal hormone treatment because of menopausal symptoms. So basic baseline investigation. I think we need to start with an assessment of the glycemic profile, so an HbA1c, the blood lipids, blood pressure to make sure this is well controlled and if not to adjust the medications. And with regards to background screen for the risk factors like liver or kidney function, which can be done with a simple blood test, that should be enough in order to give a profile together with the body mass index, which is not test to be prescribed, but good to be performed in the clinic, an assessment of the weight and the height, potentially investigation, evaluation is the right word for central obesity, to give a good insight for the presence of cardiovascular risk factors. Well, thank you very much. So very clear, basic somatometric parameters and plus uh, uh, basal biochemistry, and that would be enough in order to have an assessment and continues and continue. Uh, Antonio, these are uh, new uh, medications, so we have a couple of quick questions. Uh, I was particularly uh, impressed by the data you presented about the about sleep. So. Do we have a plausible hypothesis about this effect? Is it through the reduction of the vasomotor symptoms or is there another individual mechanism concerning the effect of this medication on sleep? Well, that's a, a great question. Uh, this is, uh, nobody knows actually because uh, there are data already with uh, hormones, with uh, menopausal hormone therapy in which the control of uh, basomotor symptoms uh, was associated also with improvement in the sleep. But it is uh, difficult uh, to um, dissect the uh, impact of the basomotor symptom, the reduction of the basomotor symptom, symptom and a potential direct effect on sleep. Um, as far as I know, uh, there is uh, no uh, Biologic, biologic, no, no non biological plausibility, plausibility uh, of um, the blockade of the receptor for neurokinin and a direct impact uh, on uh, the mechanism of, of sleep. Probably also because we know very little about that. Uh, this is uh, quite an explored area and uh, the uh, mechanisms of uh, sleep uh, are still uh, an area of much investigation. But obviously, uh, it is interesting the data, uh, the clinical data found uh, in the uh, uh, skylight, for example, and also it's worth uh, to design, for example, uh, a study in which uh, women with uh, sleep problems 
might be uh, randomized to uh, either uh, one antagonist of neurokinin and uh, placebo, for example. That's something that might have uh, plenty of interest because a skylight was not designed for that. Uh, that was a secondary endpoint, and uh, the conclusion is still uh, very debatable. Thank you very much, Antonio. And a final question. Is this the, the only mo molecule that we will expect, or uh, do we have to expect for a series for other neurokinin antagonists? Yes, this is an area of uh, much research. Uh, there are other uh, big companies, Fesolinetan, I think everybody knows that is uh, marketed by Stellas, but um, there are other companies like, for example, Bayer, that uh, has another uh, product, Elinsanetant, and uh, as far as I know, AstraZeneca, for example, Pavinetant, and uh, also uh, in more basic research, for example, uh, there is a publication uh, from our colleague and good friend, Professor Susan Davies, uh, in Australia, with uh, a molecule which uh, I couldn't uh, reproduce uh, the name because it, it's only a code. It's uh, three letters and three numbers, uh, just a code of a product, which is uh, just uh, being uh, designed and uh, they are investigating with that. Uh, this is to my knowledge, but probably there is much more around. Thank you very much. So dear colleagues, we have reached the end of today's webinar. I hope that thanks to our speakers, we are now much wiser about assessing the cardiometabolic risk and alleviating the vasomotor symptoms in menopausal women in a personalized way. I remind you that today's webinar will be shortly accessible on the IMS website and the dedicated YouTube uh, channel. Until the next uh, webinar, goodbye by all of us. Bye-bye.